We're talking today with Ellsworth, better known as Wasi Vale, uh, of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay. Now, can you begin with some background on yourself and start with where and when were you born? I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. In what year? Oh, April 1st, April Fool's Day, 1923. Also, Easter Sunday. All right. And then how long did you live in Cincinnati? When I was 12 years old, my dad worked for a company, a brass company in Cincinnati, and the owner died. So the son took over the operation, went down in Kentucky, and lost all the company's money at the racetrack. Oh boy. So somebody in Grand Rapids bought the dead company mm -hmm. and moved it to Grand Rapids. And my dad, back in those days, the early 30s, moved with him in order to have a job. Mm -hmm. And I've been in Grand Rapids ever since. Okay. All right. I started out in the Holland Division area and then moved around. Okay. All right. Uh, now, did you finish high school? I went to South High School, President Ford's High School. All right. And then did you graduate from there? I graduated from there in 1942. All right. So you were in high school then when the war started? The war started when I was in the last six months of my high school, right. December of 41. Right. Okay. And do you remember how you heard about Pearl Harbor? I remember that as my folks well, my house at the time, too. Mm -hmm. Rather large dining room. I was standing on the heat register trying to stay warm <laughs> in December. <laughs> and I heard it on the radio. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, at that point, uh, had you ever heard of Pearl Harbor or anything like that? Not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, possibly, but I didn't know right. anything about it. Okay. Now, had you before that, I, were you paying attention to the news in the world, to the war in Europe, and that kind of thing? To a certain extent, yes. Okay. And, and did you have the expectation that we might have to get into that? That the Americans might join that war? N no. Well, yes. I mean, they've been with France and mm -hmm. England before. But, uh,. I heard that Japanese had some people over here talking to us about different things, and all of a sudden it happened. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, once it happened, uh, did some of your friends go and enlist right away, or did you all wait till you graduated, or just wait to be drafted? I lived on LaBelle Street near South High School. And there was about four of us on that street. And I really don't know what they all did. Mm -hmm. But, uh, oh yes, there were three of us that went to Kalamazoo for our induction mm -hmm. together. One was 4F and myself and another friend were inducted. Mm -hmm. Okay, but basically you and your friends kind of waited to see what would happen and they just drafted you. Yes. I didn't, didn't really understand what one service was. I heard of Navy mm -hmm. and all these different things, but I really didn't know the difference. Right. Okay. So now you're drafted then, I guess you actually get inducted in early 1943. So that's about a year after Pearl Harbor itself. But by then you'd finished high school. Um, I finished high school. Now, did you work for a little while after you finished school? I worked. I was very lucky in that my dad got me into the shop where he worked, mm -hmm. the brass company right. again. Right. And I actually worked between my junior and senior year in high school there too. Mm -hmm. okay. I learned how to be a tool maker 
to make tools for making brass. Right. Okay. Uh, now you get drafted, okay, and you go down to Kalamazoo to get sworn in, uh, yes. and then where do they send you next? Well, they sent me back to Grand Rapids okay. at the old downtown terminal mm -hmm. to wait one week, and then I took the train to Camp Grant, Illinois, mm -hmm. just out of Chicago, a right. ways. Okay. And now, did you uh, train there or just get processed? I got processed, but we had three days of test. Mm -hmm. And I guess by those tests, they decide what kind of a outfit for you to get into. Okay. All right. And then after they finish that testing, then where do they send you for basic training? For basic training, I went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And I remember going through Canada on the train, right. going over. That was a different experience for me. And the beautiful thing about Fort Devens was it only got down to 30 below zero. <laughs> <laughs> time. So that was a little bit tough. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, did they have barracks for you at Fort Devens at least? We did have barracks. And I wrote a note home to my girlfriend and said, I'm really getting ahead in this army. I'm over 21 men. I sleep upstairs and they sleep upstairs. <laughs> All right. Now, now, what did the training consist of at that point? At that point, it was uh, a lot of GI movies and our first introduction to close order drill. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really basic training. Right. And I guess we went on the rifle range and learned how to take the M1 rifle across apart and put it back together in the dark. Okay. Right. Uh, and did they put a lot of emphasis on, on discipline, on following orders and that kind of thing? Not too much, but the one thing I always remember was follow your last order first. No, I'm not quite sure why that was, but well, I suppose in, in case of emergency, then your, your commander might have to give you a new order. Yeah. And your, your, your and life might depend on it. he doesn't want you spinning your wheels on something else. Right. Okay. Uh, and now, were you training there? Did the men you were training with, were they going to go off and, and become regular infantry? Or were oh. you preparing for something different? Yes. At Fort Devons, we were taking the basic training in the 3rd Amphibious Brigade, which was a big group. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had boat companies and shore companies. My first assignment was a boat company. Okay, so basically you were training not just for general training, but you were training to for go... For amphibians, right. the, the small boats were 30 feet long mm -hmm. and had the ramps. Right. And uh, there's two or three types. Right. Okay. So, uh, now, did you start training in those? Yes, but not right away. Okay. Uh, we finished basic training mm -hmm. at Fort Devens. I was sent to a motor school and spent maybe a month. I don't know what it says there, but mm -hmm. that's yeah. it, uh, uh, training. Oh, I think it was here. Yeah. Okay. Training to uh, take apart automobile motors and everything else. Then we next moved to Camp Edwards on Cape Cod mm -hmm. in uh, Massachusetts. And there we started getting our boat training. Right. Because I was in high school, I took a lot of math classes, mm -hmm. mechanical drawing and this stuff. So when I wrote all the tests in the Army, I was very mechanical. Mm -hmm. So I got the privilege of being the uh, boat crew in those boats was three. Mm -hmm. the, the coxswain, mm -hmm. the engineer, 
in the seaman. Mm -hmm. I got to be engineer on the company commander's boat. Mm -hmm. That sounded great. And we start learning about diesel engines and whatnot. And then we get out in Cape Cod and out there at his Chris Craft Cruiser, which I'm the engineer, mm -hmm. I keep it running. Then we watched them practice the landing and whatnot. But the only trouble was I spent an awful lot of my time over the side seasick. Oh. <laughs> so within a week or so, I got transferred to a land company. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got appointed to a duck company. Okay. Now, can you explain for a general audience what a duck is? A duck is an army two and a half ton truck that has a boat body put on it. Mm -hmm. And we could go on land. On the early ducks, we had to get out with an air compressor and change the air in our tires. Mm -hmm. on, the later, on the later models, I could just reach down here and had six valves. Mm -hmm. I could change the air pressure in the tires while driving. Mm -hmm. The reason why we did this, when we went across the soft sand beaches, we would go down to 10 pounds of air and they spread out to get through. Mm -hmm. When we come back to the hard surface roads, if we put 40 pounds in there, we could go 45 miles an hour on the road, if it was a good road. Right. Of course, we drove in the mud and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Yeah. But now, I will say also, Back in Camp Edwards, we had tents, and it was very cold, and we slept on folding cots at night with lots of comforters and a little pop belly stove in the middle of the tent. Mm -hmm. Now, by the time you're out there, it's at least getting to be spring by then, right, though? I mean, it's, it's not February anymore. Yeah. Uh, but it's still, but it still can be pretty cold out, out there on Cape Cod and yeah. at night and in, in, in the spring, too, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, what kinds of men were in your unit with you? Where were they from, or what kind of background did they have? It seemed like quite a few of them were from southern Illinois. I don't know why, but, uh, but I remember later on, one was from Georgia. After we got home, I went down to see him. Mm -hmm. One in uh, New York, uh, Kodat, mm -hmm. and uh, we really were scattered from all over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you might have just had one batch of draftees that happened to be from Southern Illinois who were sent all in one one group. Uh, well, it could be that, but but time by me changing a couple times, right. you know, we got messed up. Okay. I was in the service for just under three years. Mm -hmm. I never saw one civilian that I knew in that three years. Never got a furlough or anything to come home. So I was gone from Grand Rapids for the full, I think it's 11 days short of three years. All right. Okay. So you train in, in Massachusetts and then you, and you, you train with now with, with, with the Ducks. Now, were you assigned to a specific company by this time? Can I back up yes, a little bit? Yes. From Cape, Cape Cobb, when I got into the duck company, mm -hmm. then two of us or three of us got put on a train and we went to Multiville, South Carolina on our own, not with. Mm -hmm. And in Multiville, South Carolina is where we got the duck training. Okay. So you do that. And then, and then in the duck training on the beach there, we would take turns. We'd had to drive a duck out and get it stuck. Mm -hmm. Our, then the other guy had to go back and try to get it out. <laughs> because the duck was a complex thing, we had a nice winch on the back. And if you went over a sand dune, you got, got 
belly up on right. the sand dune and no wheels and you couldn't mm -hmm. go. So we'd take the cable out and hook it on a tree and pull myself off. Mm -hmm. Later on that proved to save my life in New Guinea. Mm -hmm. We might get to that a little bit okay. later. All right. So you've done some, some training in South Carolina. Now, and then after you finish that, uh, where do you go next? The next, I got acquainted with a five-day train ride to San Francisco, and I got to go through the hot desert country, and I saw all the brown grass. Mm -hmm. Here I am from Michigan, not, mm -hmm. not used to that brown grass. All right. And we got, uh, I'm not sure, was it Camp Stallman? Yes. In, uh, not in California. California. Yeah. Oh, by that time I had been in Motorville, South Carolina, I got appointed to the 466 mm -hmm. Amphibious Truck Company. Right. And then when we got to California, we waited 30 days for a boat. Mm-hmm. So, so, so how did you spend your time in, 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 in California? One nice day, we put a 65-pound pack on our back and walked. 10 or 15 miles out and mm -hmm. put a packed display and walked back. And we took advanced basic training, I okay. guess. But we were really just, didn't know it, but we were waiting for a boat. Right. Okay. Now, did you get to go into San Francisco? Could you be a tourist at all? No. No. Just no. stay there and camp. Uh, we were a little bit north of San Francisco. Right. Now, did they provide any entertainment for you? I mean, did they have movies or things like that there? I think yes, they had PX and a few things. Mm -hmm. It was a it was a nice developed camp. Right. It wasn't like Camp Edwards, which mm -hmm. was just a tent city. Right. Okay. Now when they finally get you on a boat, what kind of boat was it? Well, I think we warned the day before, but at four o'clock in the morning, we walked up the gangplank and got on a, I think it was a Dutch freighter passenger combination mm -hmm. and we went up on that very early in the morning. I might say too, they gave us barracks bags with clothing for six months in any climate. I had heavy uh, so wool, trench coats, yeah. and wool blankets and whatnot. So then we started out in the Pacific Ocean, went under the Golden Gate Bridge, still in the dark, mm -hmm. scared to death. <laughs> and then we took the very long trip south mm -hmm. to stay out of the sub range. Right. Went all the way down by New Zealand and then ended up in Australia, Townsville which I think is one of the northern cities yes. in Australia. Right. And it was an important base for getting to New Guinea and the Solomon Islands and so forth. All right. Now, how long did the sea voyage take? 30 days. 30 days. And I met my Army lifetime friend, the two of us, over the side sea. <laughs> <laughs> Very seasick. In fact, when you had to sleep down in the holes, four up in cots and whatnot, mm -hmm. we couldn't stand it. So he and I slept on deck mm -hmm. every night. And you try to get in the dead center of the ship right. because it tips this way and that way. Mm -hmm. So you uh, didn't get too bad. Okay. Now, did you ever get used to being at sea? Did the seasickness die down? When I was on the way over, when you would lay on the deck in the daytime and see the mass swinging back and forth and the thing, that was bad. You mm -hmm. had to learn to look straight in. Mm -hmm. I didn't eat too much. But uh, but I wasn't in control. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Later on, when I started driving a duck up to 12 hours a day, I went through heavy surf, mm -hmm. all kinds of things, which we'll hear about later. Right. But I was in control, mm -hmm. and I was not sick. Right. Well, you had something to do. <laughs> yeah, you had something to keep you occupied. Right. Okay. Uh, now, when you crossed the equator, did they do a ceremony or something? Yes. I don't remember much detail of it, but they, you are right. They, I think I, at that point going over, I went south of the equator, and I mm -hmm. think I stayed there for a long time. All right. And, uh, because a lot of these ships have a, a King Neptune ceremony or something like that. and I... The memory isn't too yeah, Okay, memory. that's fine. All right. But, uh, yes, we did have some type of a ceremony. Okay. Now, did you stop over in New Zealand or just go quickly No, we through? just went by it. Okay, went by it. All right. Okay. And then, and when you got to Australia, was, was Townsville the first place you landed? We landed at Townsville. Mm-hmm. But I got to say, we never got off the ship. Okay. I saw, I saw the... Australians, the men, with their shorts on mm -hmm. and their uniforms because they were used to warm country. Mm -hmm. And here we were all dressed for heavy winter clothing. Okay. Uh, but had they given you any lighter weight clothing too? I think I had the lighter yeah, weight. because you yes. said you had like clothing for six months and different kinds of things. Okay. okay. That was part of the, the thought of not letting anybody know where we were going. Right. Okay, so so Townsville is just a brief refueling resupply stop, um, and then where do they take you after Townsville? Well, at Townsville, we picked up a convoy of four ships. Okay, and then I think it took us about three days to go up to Melanie Bay mm -hmm. in the very southern tip of New Guinea. Right. Okay, and, and that was my first introduction to jungle. Right. Okay, uh, and then what were you doing at Milne Bay? Because we hadn't received our ducks yet, we did what they call stevedoring. Are you familiar with what that is? Yeah, but you should explain it. Uh, they did have one small dock there, and the boats would come in, and we were hand loading and unloading those mm -hmm. boats until our ducks got there. Right. And then we got a bunch of quite a few used ducks that they gathered up. And by that time, the Liberty ships were coming in, but no docks. Mm -hmm. So we start going out with our duck, say a half mile off shore, mm -hmm. and loading up and driving in to the dumps inland. Now, Milne Bay was a little bit developed when mm -hmm. we got there. Right. So there were docks that mm -hmm. we would take food supply or gasoline. We, we hauled lots of 50-gallon gasoline barrels. Okay. All right. A 50-gallon barrel, that, that weighs what, Four or like five, 400, 400 pounds. 400 pounds, right. Yeah. I'll tell you more about that later, too. All right. Uh, and then uh, we're... At, at Milne Bay, were there any uh, native New Guinea people working there, or just Australians or Americans? It was Australians and Americans. I didn't see many New Guinea people there. Right. Uh, I remember it was about 20 mile gravel road down along there mm -hmm. that we would drive up and down. But uh, we learned how to dig we had a, a tent city, mm -hmm. and we had to dig foot-wide trenches along the edge of our tent down to the ocean off the side of the hill mm -hmm. because it only rained once or twice a day. <laughs> and those trenches would carry off all the water. Right. And we were there four or six months. Okay. Then we went up to Finchhaven. Mm -hmm. It was part way up the New Guinea. Right. And that was our first introduction to there's a field living. Mm hmm So the the ships used to 
used a thing they called dunnage. When they were loading ships, they'd lay boards across for the next layer. Mm -hmm. We used to get that dunnage, and that's what we built our tent floors with. Right. And uh, so, would you build the tents with the floors up off the ground? Yes. Okay. Because it was so wet and muddy. Mm -hmm. uh, driving in the mud down there, I was sure happy I had driven in Grand Rapids ice and snow. Right. Because the way we slipped in the snow, we slipped the same way in the mud. And uh, now, did they were they giving you uh, medicines to prevent malaria? Yes, I took Adabrine, a yellow pill, mm -hmm. and eventually we all turned yellow. And it got so the fellows wouldn't take it. Mm -hmm. It got so severe, an officer stood at the head of the line and threw the pill in your mouth. All right. And so did you keep taking your Adabrin the whole time you were in the tropics, or did you stop after a yeah, while? I took it all the way. Can I dump, jump ahead a little yeah, bit? Yeah. I, I took it all the way through, but I stopped when I came home. Mm -hmm. I was home about a few days and my church had a basketball team and I played basketball five hours one night. Mm -hmm. By that time, I sweated out all the adabrine. The next day, I had malaria. Okay, although the adabrine is supposed to prevent you from getting infected with it. At least I had what we thought was malaria mm -hmm. and I, our friends went down and got us more adabrine and we mm -hmm. took it for a while and it eventually went away. I think I may have had a 10% pension for one year mm -hmm. for that. Okay. Right. But now back. <laughs> right. Okay. So you're back there and, and you're back in Finchhafen. And so basically you have to create your own camp and yes. build your own tents. Um, and in that area, I mean, did you ever have problems with, with Japanese aircraft coming over or anything like that? Yes. Uh, we had what we call six-man tents. And we build these tents. And I told you about the drain that mm -hmm. we put in. That also served as a foxhole when the Jap planes come over at night. Mm -hmm. They never came over at daytime, but there would be a few small planes, I don't know if it was Zeros or small mm -hmm. bombers, they'd come over and we claim they always come over at night to keep us awake. Right. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to work the next day. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. after a while, they would, but we were inland. Mm -hmm. I mean, just off the beach. Yeah. But we had ships out in the harbor. So they primarily went after the ships right. in the harbor because we were small fry. Mm -hmm. But we would sometimes get a warning they were coming in and we'd black out. No, no lights. Mm -hmm. Of course, we didn't have that many lights. Uh, in a new camp like that, we had candles mm -hmm. that for the first 30 days till we got and they built up a generator or something. Okay. Now, when you're out there in a place like Milne Bay or in Finchhafen, uh, how much do you know about what's happening in the rest of the war? Not much. Uh, in Finchhaven or New Guinea, mm -hmm. there were no PXs or anything like that. You were, I don't know if we got some, the company office may have got some radio or mm -hmm. something, but uh, we really didn't know what was going on okay. too much. Now, would you see people passing through on their way to or from areas where there was fighting, so you saw some evidence of the yes. war? We, when a big ship would come in with a lot of troops on it, mm -hmm. they would put floating docks a long time, long time, the big, like 15,000 troops coming in, mm -hmm. and, the, and the infantry, we come down on the docks 
then we'd drive up with our duck and 25 or 30 men would jump in and we'd drive them mm -hmm. to the camp sign. Right. And then from there on they went inland to get on up to the front. Mm -hmm. Probably we were a couple miles back. Mm -hmm. And back to the Japanese planes coming over, you'd hear them coming and you'd turn out all the lights. Then you'd hear them, they'd come in high, see. One would drive, dot, drop down mm -hmm. and drop his bombs and take off. The others would turn off their motors. So we'd all turn on our lights. <laughs> And here come the other ones now. So we soon learned to be a little bit more careful. Mm -hmm. I was lucky in that I was in the beach, mm -hmm. not out in the water where they come right. out there. Okay, so they ne nothing ever landed very close to you then? Not really. Okay. Not really. Yeah, I mean, did uh, your, your company take any, any casualties? Uh, the type of casualties we took where you heard me talk about these gasoline drums that mm -hmm. weighed 400 right. pounds. Right. We could get 16 of them on our duck, but the way they loaded them with hooks on the side, the stevedores would run these cables up and swing the barrels out and bring them down to our duck. Mm -hmm. Okay, the stevedores goofed. They were too low as they come across the rail of the ship. They broke loose and crushed the driver right in the seat. Mm -hmm. One of our men from Georgia come over and picked that 400 pound drum off and threw it off of it, but he was gone. Mm -hmm. okay. So accidents would be the, the main risk for at, at that stage in time. Another maintenance man was working on a duck. He had a toolbox in his hand. From six feet up, he jumped down with the toolbox in his head, wrecked his back, mm -hmm. and he went home. Right. We had others that had vision problems. Okay. Now, at, when you're at a, at a large base like, like Finchhafen, were there men who were there who were just stevedores? So you were the truck oh, guys? Oh, yes, okay. yes. And, and were those men white or black? Good question. They were black. Okay. But we trusted them because they were loaded with all time. There was only this one accident that mm -hmm. I know of. Mm -hmm. One time, they were loading big timbers, and I was standing on my duck waiting to bring that timber. And the way we did our ducks, when we come up to a Liberty ship, they would hook a line on. We'd put it in low speed forward and turn out, and that would hold us right against the ship mm -hmm. while they were loading. Well, I was standing there, and here come this uh, lumber down, but it was real long. Mm -hmm. And they were missing my cargo hatch, so I had to dive over into the ocean with all my clothes on, <laughs> watches, and everything else. And, but, yes, the black stevedores did a good job. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're ashore, do you associate with them at all, or do they keep you guys all separate? I don't remember them seeing them any place. Mm -hmm. We were in a little company by ourselves. Right. We did not even have movies and whatnot. Mm -hmm. okay. We put a duck in one time. A bunch of us would get in a duck to drive to some other area with some bigger knives. Mm -hmm. One night we were driving down the road and went over a log in the road. We, somebody said, hey, the log's moving. <laughs> it was a big snake in the oh. room. Yeah. And did, did they have crocodiles where you were? I never saw I crocodiles. Any of those. Okay, well, that's good. Lots of big lizards. And, mm -hmm. All right. Of course, mosquitoes all the time. We slept in nets all mm -hmm. the time. All right. And then at, at Finchhafen, were there any New Guinea natives around or working for you, or did they, or did you not see them there either? Uh, natives? Natives, yeah. Not yet. Okay. All right. Uh, now you're at Finchhafen for an extended period of time, and then 
Uh, did anything else happen there that you want to bring into your story? Well, we had three platoons and a maintenance platoon, mm -hmm. about 400 men in our company. Right. About a month before I left there, our second platoon loaded on the LSTs. You know what the LSTs are, the big naval ships. Right. And they went up. Later on, they split off from us. Later on, we heard that they went up to Hollandia mm -hmm. and had our first landing of my company. About a month later, we were in Finchhaven, and a submarine, a U.S. submarine, in Los Negros in the Amalfi Islands, landed one night, and were able to get on an island. No docks or anything, but the Japanese were over on Manus Island on the mm -hmm. other side, so they quick shipped us over there, right. and that's where we really got into our total duck operation of loading when we were the only source of getting supplies in and out okay. in Las Vegas in the Amity Islands. And this was my first experience with being just two degrees below, below the equator. Mm -hmm. Some days we'd go out and look on our tent and it would say 120 degrees. So we started with just pants mm -hmm. and shoes and socks on. That's all we wore for months. Okay. Now, didn't you get sunburned? I got very brown. Okay. But thanks good goodness, I didn't get burned. Mm -hmm. I had oil on my skin, and I was got away with it. Okay. All right. So you, you kind of adjusted that. Now, uh, what was going on in the Admiralty Islands? I mean, was there fighting going on that you were supporting, or were they just building a base? Uh, I understand eventually it ended up being a big naval police, mm -hmm. well, but I remember being on Los Negros here, and Manus Island was over mm -hmm. here. And I remember bringing in 155 and 105 Hollister shells, mm -hmm. we drove on the Los Negros and we took them over to the big guns, mm -hmm. and they would shoot them over the harbor into the Japanese over on Manus. Yeah, because Manus became an important American base. I a, think a lot of ships, a lot of guys I talked to I, wound up there can later. Can you confirm that? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I heard that because we didn't stay there too mm -hmm. long. And uh, at Manus, also one time, I got put on detached service, I guess to the 1st Cavalry Division and went out with my duck. My assistant driver who was with me, the fellow I was seasick with, mm -hmm. went over and they put a radio, an infantry radio command post mm -hmm. on our duck. Mm -hmm. And we went over to Manus Island. We had a native guide that had to show us how Show me how to drive through the reefs right. and whatnot. And we'd drop the infantrymen off on the beach. And we'd say, we'll meet you down the beach one mile. Mm -hmm. And then they would filter down through the beach there. And then we'd pick them up and bring them back. And we had this radio command post with us. One night, we were anchored on the beach, that we were in the water, mm -hmm. I mean, we were anchored there, uh, I don't know, four or five o'clock at night, and there was five of us on the duck, and we were making our own food, you mm -hmm. know, see, uh, see, see rations right. and whatnot. We would take a gallon can, fill it up with sand, and pour some gasoline in it, cut edges on it, and that's how we cook our food. Mm -hmm. One night we were busy doing all of a sudden, and without us really realizing, all of a sudden we saw a machine gun bullets going down alongside of our dock. Mm -hmm. I jumped in the driver's seat, I had the thing running, 
and I started taking off, you know. And naturally, we still had the anchor down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but somebody quick pulled that up. But about that time, an infantryman up there got the machine gun nest mm -hmm. and saved us. Okay, so there are still some bad guys around then. Yeah, there was some. That's what they were on the mopping up operations. Right. Okay, all right. Uh, and then you from now from Manus, do you go back to Los Negros and rejoin the company, or what do you do next? Yeah, I was only on this detached service about a, a week or okay. two. And then we went back to Los Negros mm -hmm. and continued loading and unloading. Right. And uh, as I showed you some pictures earlier, mm -hmm. Los Negros had a lot of artillery and whatnot. So the bomb craters were a perfect place for us when the rain came in the next day, that gave us some place to wash our clothes. Mm -hmm. All right. And you also, I think, had pictures with palm trees that had their tops missing. Yeah, know. the palm trees, you had the tops with. Uh, in Los Negros, when we moved in here, it was a coconut plantation mm -hmm. is the area where we went in. And one of our fellows, he was a sergeant, took a duck and rammed a coconut tree to knock down coconuts. The next day he was a private. Oh. <laughs> and, and what happened <laughs> to the Because he banged up the front right. of the duck. <laughs> All right. Um, now, did you have men who learned how to climb up the coconut trees? And... Uh, yes, but there were some natives around. Mm -hmm. And for a couple of cigarettes, they'd go up and bring you down six trees. Okay, they do it but for you. Coconut trees grow a little bit curved. Mm -hmm. They would take and tie a rope between their ankles, about 18 inches long, and they would hop, and a coconut plant tree has rings around it, mm -hmm. and that's how they would climb up, mm -hmm. and they'd come down. One of our guys tried that, and he got up a few feet, and all of a sudden, couldn't work it and slid all the way down and tore uh -huh. all the skin off of his arms. <laughs> so after that, you let the natives do the work? Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, now, um, and then after you're on the Admiralty Islands, where do they send you next? Well, then we went back to northern New Guinea. Mm -hmm. And this was our first experience with New Guinea, high temperature, because of a tick on the ground, mm -hmm. we had to wear pants with leggings and shoes mm -hmm. and button up our shirt all the time. And we took our clothing and we took a big tub, a galvanized tub, and put mosquito repellent in it and fell snaps of soap mm -hmm. and made up a solution and dipped our clothes in there and dried them, and that's the way we wore our clothes. Okay. And that was the real ju jungle we got in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Now, this is sort of now you've kind of moved up to kind of the opposite end of the island from where you were when you started. You'd been yes, on the very southern yeah. tip, and now you're kind of on the northwest end, Sanzapur or someplace like yeah. that. All right. Uh, now, is this still an air... Now, in, in that place, would there still be Japanese aircraft coming over, or was it quieter? It seemed like they were coming over for a long time, but okay. it, it got quieter too, mm -hmm. I think. All right. Yeah. I, now, someplace, where was it at? That we got into American planes. The CBs would come in mm -hmm. on a flat thing of ground, and they put two big bulldozers. I don't know so far apart, mm -hmm. and they stretch a cable between them. And they would drive down, and that's how they cleared off all the trees and brush mm -hmm. for building a runway, right. which they'd bring in the metal slats and build a temporary runway for mm -hmm. the for our own planes to right. come in and out of. Okay. All right. And were you still doing the same kind of work? You are just loading and unloading ships? and Yes. But we had 
troops and ammunition, mm -hmm. food, and a horrible thing to say. We even loaded garbage on them and took it out and dumped it in, oh, the, yeah. in the water. But, uh, and, uh, you, you mentioned before we start, at some point earlier, you talked about how when you were down in, in Moultrieville, you were learning how to pull out ducks and things. You okay. said that saved you on New Guinea at some point. Uh, now, when we were up in this sand support area, mm -hmm. we had to go through a swamp to get to our company area and we get stuck. Mm -hmm. So we would take the winch and if there's a tree back of you, fine. If there's a tree ahead of you, we would feed the winch cable through an eye up front mm -hmm. and you would hook on the, over there and winch yourself out. But the trouble is you're in your driver's seat. That cable was only a few feet away from you. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about cables and winches, if you ever break one, it snaps and yeah. just cuts down everything. Mm -hmm. So we had to be very careful. Now I'll go back to the Amalfi Islands, if mm -hmm. I may. Yep. Now we had the native guiding us. All of a sudden he turned around and said, stop, stop. I jammed it in reverse. Our front wheels went up on the reef, but we come off. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't know, we had a couple fellows in the back of the duck who had some clothing out on a rope, mm -hmm. washing it in our wake. <laughs> so that's when I jammed it in reverse, it sucked all that clothing into our the propellers. So, so, so we're dead. Mm -hmm. But this native, we give him a great big long knife and he drove down underneath and got it off. Mm -hmm. Another time we went up on the reef and got stuck on the reef. So what are we going to do? We took the spare tire off, which was on the back deck, laid an anchor on it, hooked the winch to it, swam it to another reef, mm -hmm. dropped the winch over that, and winched ourselves off of the first <laughs> reef. And you realize this is almost no man's land. Right. If you don't do it, you don't survive. Mm -hmm. so. And there wasn't anybody else around to help you. No. No, just you guys. All right. Okay. Now, um, as you're going from these different places, are, are you getting any uh, letters from home? Do you get a mail call or things like that? I, we had a, what they call it, a POA address. Mm -hmm. and we would get mail about 30 days back. Right. And we start using V-mail. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know about V-mail. Yeah. They basically photograph it and microfilm They photograph it, it and microfilm. And was that coming or going? That was going back home, yeah. I think. Yeah. And Although, actually, I think it, it actually could go both ways because I have guys telling me about receiving V-mails like someone getting a V-mail telling his daughter had been born or something when he was on New Guinea. So, uh, but yeah, it was an efficient way of, of, of moving that. So you, you hear occasionally. Well, I did get some. In fact, I would write home and we had to learn how to be barbers. You know, we didn't have any barber shops. Mm -hmm. And I sent a letter back to my folks and they sent me a pair hand hair clippers. <laughs> Got a couple months to get there, mm -hmm. but uh, I had some communication, yes. Okay. All right. Now you're, let's see, we're going to... Could I just sit and listen? Sure. Yeah. Sit over here. Okay. All right. Um, now, when we're, now we've moved in your story now, we've gotten you... Um, we're in northern... No, no, we've got northern New, New Guinea, so we're kind of getting... Um, you know, late in the year in 1944 by this time. And yes. then, and, and there was, were there other things that went on there before you went to the Philippines or is that kind of the next piece of the story? Well, same as usual, we built up a beautiful tent city mm -hmm. and 
had to haul our water because we never had any water. And sometimes we'd go to a creek to take a shop or take a bath mm -hmm. in the creek. Okay. But uh, we were, I guess, in the northern, we were more of a staging area getting ready. Mm -hmm. Right. So then, like you say, in late 44, we start forming a convoy mm -hmm. at northern New Guinea, and I don't know where all they come from, but we had 87 full-size ships. Mm -hmm. And we started north, and we didn't know where we were going. And we were four ships abreast. I was on one of the inside ships. So the outside ships had permission to fire at planes if they come in or mm -hmm. whatnot. But the inside ships had to hold their fire. And we had the Japanese uh, destroyers for sub chasers and whatnot going around. Yeah. Well, you had American destroyers, I hope. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, American destroyers. Okay. Now, at this point, were the Jap so the Japanese could threaten you with submarines and aircraft, basically? Uh, I, what I didn't say later, on the way over and on all these places, the ships, when you passed another ship, they would flash with their lights back and forth. Of course, mm -hmm. we didn't know what they were saying. They would all say, there was a Japanese north of us last mm -hmm. night. Make sure you stay south and yeah. so forth. And uh, so on. And uh, when we went up to going north there, we know that there was a previous landing in uh, the Philippines right. over on the, would that be the east side? about halfway up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, late in October and then a couple late, other islands late. there, yeah. And we went up and right by there and cut across. Mm -hmm. Then we were in prime territory. And then we went up to the Ngayon Gulf. Mm -hmm. And that's where we made a big landing. Uh, we were a mile offshore, and the boat we had to let us go off. And we got out there and ran in circles, waiting for our turn, for our wave to go in. Mm -hmm. And my duck was loaded, somebody else, I don't know who loaded it, but I had a field infantry hospital on board. So, the first wave went in, a uh, half hour later, my wave went in with the field hospital. Mm -hmm. There were, I don't know all, but we used what they call Blue Beach. There were other beaches that mm -hmm. they had to do it. And Blue Beach had a very slight one degree taper which landing craft couldn't even use. So that's why the ducks got to use that one. And that's why the Japanese didn't have any defenses there. Okay. So the problem there is the water is so shallow as you come up to the beach that the landing craft couldn't get far enough in? Well, they tried, yeah. but they all got broached and mm -hmm. whatnot, which I'll come back to later too. So our ducks, we could bring this stuff on in. Mm -hmm. On the way in, Offshore, we were told to open our bilge plugs. That's where seawater can come in the mm -hmm. bottom. So we got that, and then this before we hit the beach, we turned them off. I had other fellows on the dock. I was driving, right. but right. there was other fellows on the dock. The purpose of that was, if we hit any landmines, it was supposed to give us support. Mm -hmm. I was also instructed to make sure you drive the path of other... The one went uh, in front of you, yeah. yeah. And with our group, we landed 105,000 men that day mm -hmm. and lost six men mm -hmm. going in. 
Right. And what they happened is the ones that went off with the landing craft, and then they walked off the front onto what they thought was land. It was a sandbar, mm -hmm. and then they were in deep water right. with flame floors and all this heavy stuff on their back that they couldn't get off. Mm -hmm. So the ones who were lost kind of basically drowned or whatever. That was not due to Japanese right. action, but okay. then when I got on shore, no one told me what to do with it. <laughs> Here I am with a hospital and <laughs> no instructions. Okay. So you've just got the equipment, you don't have the, the personnel with you, no. so there's no doctor. Or there was no doctors or anything with it. <laughs> so we finally got a bunch of people and unloaded it, then I went back to do my normal duty. And did they ever ask you where the hospital was? No. <laughs> okay, I guess they found it. Nobody knew I had it, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure the infantry people picked it up right. later on. We were, like you say, 20 minutes behind the front line. Okay. Now, before you did the landing, was there an artillery bombardment, or a naval bombardment, or anything the like Navy that? The Navy was there for three days, Okay. hitting it ahead of time. And like I told you, the top of the trees are off, and bomb craters were there, mm -hmm. and all that when we actually got there. But So when we got there, the first three or four days, we had to sleep on the beach with a tarp or anything else over mm -hmm. we could get. We finally got where each man had a half, and we built a two-man tent. But we lived on the land for 30 days mm -hmm. before our equipment got there. Okay. Now, during those 30 days, are you continuing to unload supplies? And, yes. Yeah. Well, now, because the Navy had broached a bunch of ships on there. Okay. One type, there, one night, there was a naval officer on the shore. The surf had got so heavy that we had stopped all operation. But this Navy officer had to get back to his ship. Mm -hmm. So I got selected. They put the tarp on my duck so that not too much water would come in. Mm -hmm. Put the surfboard up so it would break and whatnot. But we had, I had to go through surf mm -hmm. and have come over us to get him back. Yeah. So I don't know why I got it selected. And I got in my duck. My foot wouldn't work. Oh. I had to put my left foot on it to get to go. Mm -hmm. But we got through it. Okay. And I got the nervous then captain or whatever he was out there and, mm -hmm. and I had to come back in the dark by myself. Okay. And when you come back you gotta hit it dead square. If you hit it sideways, the next wave just rolls right. you over. Yeah, because as I've I've been on on a duck, and those things always struck me. They could they could tip over fairly easily if they're hit from yeah. the wrong side. Okay, but but so you're very, and so you're basically being kind of like a surfer. And you, you have yeah, to you make have your to. way back in uh, through the waves again. Uh, now, do you know why your foot didn't work? You were just afraid, or did it? Get, I was hurt? afraid, okay. nervous. Yeah. It wouldn't. <laughs> I had to push down with two feet to get mm -hmm. it. And of course, when you're hitting that, you're going wide open. Yeah. Now. We didn't describe the ducks completely. Mm -hmm. The duck is a truck, but in addition, we have a transmission here mm -hmm. where we pull it up and the propeller starts running. Right. So we got to pull that propeller up just before we go in the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also had low and high ranges where we put all six wheel drive because you had to have everything you could. Mm -hmm. And the minute your wheels left the ground, then it was up to your propeller. And uh, you had to push all kinds of handles and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now we can go back. Okay. To... Now did any of the ducks that you were in your, in your platoon, did they ever capsize or yes. get otherwise damaged? Uh, we had ducks that would come in and capsize. And our company had a heavy duty wrecker and they bring the record down on the beach. We'd only capsize at the beach, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, because that's where the surf is worst, yeah. Uh, and then they 
we had one guy that was a pretty good diver, and he would take it out and hook a, the winch on the ducks, and they pull it in. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did it many times. One time, they hooked a, onto a hook, but pulled the pulled the whole radiator and everything out of the duck instead of hitting on the right hook. Oops. So it, uh, but yes, uh, we had, and because the ducks were in salt water all the time, we were always having brake problems and they were always putting new brakes on. Mm -hmm. And we had to learn how to stop and start by downshifting because you didn't have brakes sometimes. <laughs> Now, this tape is about up, so we're going to pause right here. Up, and we had cushions and life jackets to boot. I threw them all out as I could towards them. Uh, a Navy guy or a merchant marine dove off the ship and helped one guy up. Mm -hmm. And I drove a fast circle and come around. It took about three of us, mm -hmm. and he had gone down a couple times mm -hmm. to get him on board my dock. Right. And uh, we brought him up over the front, and then we had to drag him back to the back. And they turned me loose, and I was heading for the hospital. Mm -hmm. I could go to the normal beach place, mm -hmm. but I knew the, the clinic, or at least, uh, was over here. Mm -hmm. So I took a chance and I went across the water and landed on the beach. It was pretty rough, but I was mm -hmm. able to get him up and they, the medics got on there and gave him a shot mm -hmm. and said, we think he's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. But this is part of the side living right. of, of a duck. Right. Okay. Now we, we had gotten you in the story. You're up at Lingayen Gulf and, and at Lingayen Gulf you said you kind of camped out on the beach for about a month. Yes. Uh, now when you're up there, do the local Filipinos come in and visit yes. you there? Yes. Yes. And for three cigarettes, you could get a week's washing done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they would take it and, and yes, there was local Filipinos and mm -hmm. whatnot. And they would At one area, we, one area we built our own when we first got there. Mm -hmm. But another area, Filipinos built our tents mm -hmm. where we were going to move up to San Fernando, I believe, was mm -hmm. in the northern Luzon, and they built a floor out of bamboo sticks and whatnot. Okay. And when we were up in that area, one night. I had my duck, I was out, it was after dark, and we were unloading ships and whatnot. And in the dark like that, you're a mile offshore, we used to have two bomb fires to tell us where to come in to. Well, I get a load of sugar bags, 25 pound bags, I have a whole truckload of them, and I start for the shore, no lights. What's going on? About that time, another duck come out and said, head for deep water. The Japs are shelling the beach. Mm -hmm. They were up in the mountains, and they had got one of their artillery things mm -hmm. straightened out. So here I am out there, and I make a foxhole out of sugar bags. <laughs> 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 but the, the Navy destroyer or something come in and stop mm -hmm. the situation. Right. I was always lucky. I was just on the edge of mm -hmm. really bad things. Right. Okay. Now, um, after that month at Lingay and Gulf, do they move you again? Do you go somewhere else? Or do you stay there? Uh, we went in there, what, in January, January yeah. early January. Well, we moved up to what I could say, San Francisco, San, San Fernando. Fernando. Right. And we were, we did not move anymore. Mm -hmm. But the northern island of the Philippines, we had it starting to sink in the ocean from the amount of ammunition <laughs> and supplies we were piling up. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
we were starting to get our equipment for the invasion of Japan. Mm -hmm. We were, we knew it was coming, but then the atomic bomb slowed us up. Mm -hmm. And then what they finally signed the armistice in August. Yep. Then our company commander said, get your ducks all straightened out, but go out and play ball. Okay. So we had a couple of months of just keeping busy. Right. And uh, so forth. And we were taught always to have your duck full of gas and ready to go. Okay. Now, before the Japanese surrendered, Aside from that one incident with the artillery piece, did you have any trouble from the Japanese on Luzon? I did not, mm -hmm. because it was south. Yeah. I mean, we landed at Lingayen. The reason why we landed at Lingayen, it was, what, 150 miles north of Manila? Yep. And then they went down to get Manila rather mm -hmm. than an invasion of Manila right. where the Japanese were fortified. Right. And there were Japanese in the interior, in the hills, and different there places. There was. But not close to where you were. No, no. Okay. okay. I did get a three-day furlough from there mm -hmm. and went to Manila. But all you had to do was to have on your uniform. Mm -hmm. And some GI would pick you up. We had to hitchhike to Manila. Mm -hmm. But that was... Uh, and I got down there and I got to go to my first, uh, what did the Salvation Army or some people I had that was UFOs or USO, USO. Mm -hmm. and I got my first introduction to that because we didn't have anything like that before. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so now there's entertainment or yeah. people looking after you, okay. And then I went back, I think we were able to go back by a Filipino train. Mm -hmm up to and getting a golf. Okay. All right. And then um, you so say you spend a couple of months just entertaining yourself. Yes. And then what do they have you do next? Well, next, we had enough points to come home, mm -hmm. but no ships. Okay. So that's what we were waiting for, to build ships. And finally, on Thanksgiving Day, the war in it, and August, mm -hmm. on Thanksgiving Day, I was in a separation center, and we ate our Thanksgiving dinner standing up because we were getting ready to get on a boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we had that and got on the boat, there I was, used to the sea, but facing a long trip back home. So we we started out from northern, and one day out, we get a hurricane warning. Oh boy! So the the ship went way up, almost to Alaska, to go around it. But in the daytime, we or any time we were riding, the ship would go like this, the mm -hmm. prop would come out of the water, would go back mm -hmm. in, the whole ship would shake. And if you got in the ship up on hole number one, it was like on an elevator, yep. up and down, up and down. And, and okay. then we didn't have time to be seasick. Mm -hmm. They had to quit feeding us because they couldn't keep the food on the plates. Right. They gave us Cracker Jack type food mm -hmm. to eat. You. Now, were you, did you get sick on the way back? Somewhat, but I was smart enough that I only ate the right kind of food mm -hmm. and forced myself to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was heading home. Okay. Now, you mentioned uh, off camera that you got to southern Japan at some point? I never okay. went up. You didn't do that. Uh, did that was for the that was, I was planning, we were for the right. uh, for the invasion okay. of Japan. So you were getting ready now, to go to Japan, but you didn't actually go there. I never went to oh, Japan. Okay. All right. So you have an interesting sea voyage to get home. Uh, uh, and Well, uh, all these people, a lot of them had Australian coins. Mm -hmm. 
Have you heard about this? And you hold a, uh, I don't know, about the size of a half dollar or bigger. You hold that like this, like a spoon, and you beat it, mm -hmm. and it comes out, and you cut a hole to it and make rings out right. of it. Boy, there were all kinds of those going on <laughs> on the way home. I didn't mention going overseas because you had the blackout and everybody was smoking mm -hmm. and below deck at night you couldn't breathe the air, it was so thick. And no cigarettes on deck, you mm -hmm. know, because they cigarettes chose from up there. But coming home they at least were smoking on deck. Mm -hmm. Of course, in New Guinea, they didn't do too much smoking because they weren't available. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, where do you land in the States when you get home? I had the privilege of coming under the Gold, the Gold State really Bridge, bridge. Mm -hmm. in a rainstorm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> and back to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took a week or so to get a train load mm -hmm. to come back to uh, Camp Grand again. I yeah, I think it, your your diary here says Fort Sheridan. So okay, Fort Sheridan. That's the just north of Chicago. That's yeah. for the the lay. Yeah, and you get discharged from there. It discharged, and then we. I don't know how we got into Chicago, but we were. Mm -hmm. With the trains. passes yeah. and whatnot, to, and you had to go from one station to another. And, mm -hmm. Okay. And got back to Grant, and then we took the a train come from Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. I stood up from Holland to Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Three years. Mm -hmm. And you get home, and now it's very early like January now, of 46, that you get home. Okay. Yes. Now, what did you do after you got home? Uh, I'm trying to think. I think I took a couple weeks off. Mm -hmm. But I was able to go back to the shop where my dad had right. taught me to be a tool maker. Mm -hmm. And I started my apprenticeship in tool making. Okay. And then and I continued it, I should okay. say. So you stayed in that for, for a career? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I stayed in that for uh, till I got my apprenticeship. Right. Then later on, I transferred into a, a small printing company mm -hmm. in the experimental shop. And we built experimental self-screen printing press mm -hmm. and the thing worked <laughs> and because I was one of the two-man machine shop that we started out with we become a 70-man shop and because I was there at the beginning I got to be production manager mm -hmm. so I had a very successful your career there. Sure. Okay. Now, to look back at the time that you spent uh, in the service, how do you think that affected you? It has affected me in so many things. Working around the ships and stevedoring and the winches and whatnot, it helped me very much for my professional life of knowing how to handle unusual situations. Mm -hmm. You had to do it or you didn't survive. Right. And uh, I came back, my girlfriend at the time, and with her church and whatnot, mm -hmm. I survived. So when I went to church, I never knew what the word no one meant. Mm -hmm. Whatever they asked me to do, I did it. That's just mm -hmm. the way it is. Yeah, because you, kind of, you guys probably learned to, to, to value life and, and the gifts that you've got. Yeah. All right. Well, it makes for a good story, so I'd like to thank you for taking the time to tell it to me today. Good. All right. Thank you.